All right, so welcome to part four of RedCap Data Management, Security, and Randomization. Uh, this is Steve here. So of course, if you haven't watched parts one through three, you might want to go back and have a look at those so you know how we got here. And also, if you're using a version of RedCap that's different than 8.5.0, things might look slightly different to you, but in general, uh, the same principles should still apply. Um, so in this section, we're going to be talking about some additional customizations that are available within RedCap, and we're also going to take a look at e-signatures. So let's uh, get right into it. So first of all, we're going to go to Project Setup. And we're going to go down here to this button that says Additional Customizations. <clears throat> and this section, I think, is was kind of just created as a catch-all for all of the other features that uh, the RedCap developers had created and just didn't know where else to put. So it's kind of a random assortment of things in here, but we'll uh, take a look at them. So the first thing here is Set a Custom Record Label. So the way this works is that anywhere you see your record ID, and we'll, we'll look at some of the places, uh, you can add an additional label here. So they give an example of last name and first name, which we don't do because that's PHI. But if we wanted to do something maybe like record any, which we've uh, looked at before in a previous video, uh, all we need to do is use the same kind of notation that we use for piping and calculations. So calling the variable name inside the square brackets, and you can put pretty much any variable you want in here. Um, and just to see how this looks, let's save. <clears throat> and now if we go to the record status dashboard, in addition to just having our record ID here, uh, we also see that the participant initials are also included. So it's just a kind of a way to allow you to quickly check things. Um, an example, so one, one place that we do use this uh, in real life is for the sign-up forms for these courses is that we'll have people's email addresses in the sign-up date and it just is kind of like a nice little quick reference. Um, it shows up in a few other places so uh, up on the record homepage here you'll see it uh, within the actual forms you'll see it up here although it is very easy to ignore up there and then lastly also in the little drop-down list of IDs here. So it's basically anywhere that you would see the record ID you're gonna see whatever value you've piped in there as well. Okay, so let's go and take a look at some of these other customizations. <clears throat> the next one here is to define a secondary unique field. So I don't find that I've used this very often, but the idea here is that in addition to the record ID field, which has to be unique for every record or every participant, you can define a secondary unique field uh, that will have sort of the same function. So. Uh, maybe this is not the best example because we're not supposed to include MRN in RedCap, but for the sake of example, we can say that maybe you're going through doing a chart review um, and you want to make sure that you only capture uh, each individual one time. You could set that MRN field to a secondary unique field, and then if you tried to enter it in again, RedCap would throw up an error and prevent you from uh, entering the same MRN twice. Uh, now it doesn't have to be MRN obviously, it could be really anything you want here. So it's really kind of project specific, but you know, some of these are not going to apply because you probably will have similar dates of assessment and data entry, for example. Um, but anyways, it's one of those things just to, to be aware of and I'm sure it's like when you need it, you'll realize. Right. Anyways, uh, so the next one here is order records by another field. So I think this one's fairly self-explanatory. You can choose any of your fields here. Uh, you may want to use this if, say, you wanted to uh, order your records by, you know, date of assessment or date of date entry. Um, and this would be in places like the record status dashboard or in, in kind of reports that come out. Um, but again, it's something that I find I haven't really used at all, I think. Um, the next one here is field comment log and data resolution workflow. And uh, we're actually going to come back to this in a separate video, so I'll just leave it for now. We have PDF customizations here. So in some places in RedCap, you're able to download PDFs of forms, uh, for instance, in the data entry forms. And so there's just a few little uh, customizations here. So you can put some custom text on those PDFs. Uh, you can choose to hide the RedCap logo, logo if you want. Um, again, I've used this once or twice. So if it's it's something you think you could make use of, it uh, can be found here. Next, we have the data history widget, widget which is enabled by default. And I think this is a pretty handy feature to have. Um, the way this works is that every time you make a change to a data entry field, you'll be able to go back and see what the previous values were. And we'll take a closer look at this in a second. Uh, next, we have the Today Now button. Uh, we can choose whether to hide it or, uh, or enable it. 
and so generally I think it's useful to have uh, there like uh, enabled because if somebody needs to put in today's date it's nice just to be able to, to hit a button and for a while I didn't know why you would disable it but we recently built a project where we were asking people to enter in a date from the past and uh, we were finding that people just weren't reading the question and sort of as soon as they see that today button we've I think all just been conditioned to hit the today now button um, and it was, it was causing a real problem in data entry. So we ended up disabling it to try to force people to enter the date manually. And that seems to have solved the problem. <coughs> uh, next we have require a reason when making a change. Um, so I'm going to enable this and we'll, we'll sh take a look at how it works. So we'll come back to that in a second. And then lastly, we have the data entry trigger, which we're not going to talk about because uh, it's a little bit more of an advanced feature, um, but it allows you to sort of make an external request after certain conditions are met. Uh, like after data entry, say. Um, but we're just going to leave it for now. Um, so let's save this and have a look at some of these things. So I'm going to go to the record status dashboard, and I'll go over to example demographics again. And let's just go down to diagnosis, and let's say we wanted to change the diagnosis from schizophrenia to MDD. So we can make that change, and then we can just say save and stay. And you'll see now that when we try to make the change, we're going to get this pop-up here that asks uh, the reason for the change. So we can say something like, I don't know, maybe diagnosis was incorrect. And we'll say save. And so now if we take a look at our diagnosis field again, we can look at our little data history widget here. And we can see when the original value er, was entered, which was yesterday. And now we can see when the change was made, uh, which is today. Uh, furthermore, we also see the reason that the change was made. So it's a nice little handy tracking feature to have, or an auditing feature. Now, where this kind of falls apart, for me at least, is if you make multiple changes to the data. So say, for example, we changed MDD to healthy control. I don't know, maybe we changed male to female. And then we'll save the record again. We're going to get the same pop-up here, but unfortunately, we only get one pop-up per save. So we would have to say, Again, maybe diagnosis uh, was incorrect. And then we'd also have to say, like, sex was incorrect. Um, and you'll see now when we save and we check the data history widget, uh, we get both of those notes for the diagnosis field and then both of those notes for the sex field. So that's kind of uh, the downside of the request uh, for data changes feature. Um, one workaround, I guess, would be is if you just make one change at a time and click save and stay. Um, but that is a little cumbersome. So as as a result of that, I find that I'm not I don't really ever use the request for change uh, feature. But of course, it's up to you and uh, how you think your workflow is going to be within your project. Okay, so that does it kind of in terms of the additional customizations. Uh, let's have a look now at e signatures. So in RegCap, there's kind of two ways to get signatures, and they're pretty distinctly different depending on what type of signature you're going to be collecting. So the first way, uh, which is a way that I was not the biggest fan of until I kind of ruefully or, uh, acknowledged that maybe there is a use for it, is uh, the actual signature field inside your data collection instrument. So um, Maybe this is not a great example because you wouldn't have your participant signing your demographics form, but just for the sake of sh showing the field here, the way this works is it's as a field type um, and it's called signature and it allows the uh, data entry person to um, enter a signature using kind of their finger or their mouth, so, or sorry, mouse. Um, so we can just call this signature, maybe say demo underscore signature. And the way this looks, we can go here up to the record status dashboard and we'll go down to the bottom. We see we have this field here. So you click the add signature button and then you can kind of like scribble something in, which is uh, not always the easiest with a, a mouse, although that's not so bad. Um, but this is not great because it's like, to me, at least, anybody can kind of just scribble anything in here, and it doesn't really serve much more of a purpose than just having a kind of yes, no, do you acknowledge button. 
Um, and so really the, the only scenario that I can think to include this would be is if you have some kind of survey or maybe you're doing an e-consent form and you want the participant to sign something. But from my perspective, I'm, I'm happy enough just having a yes or no checkbox. But the idea is it's here if you want to use it. Uh, now what this shouldn't be used for is in the case of like a data, a data entry person or maybe a project coordinator or PI that's going to be kind of quote unquote signing off on these forms. So sometimes, for example, when you're collecting data on a paper form, you want to give that paper form to your PI um, to that, and they'll physically actually sign or initial the piece of paper and that will become the official study record. And uh, I know some people will sometimes kind of put this signature field into their RedCap projects to kind of be an analog of that, but there is a much better way to work. And that is through the e-signature uh, module within RedCap. And so to enable that, uh, we need to go into user rights and yeah, I'll just leave it at saving changes here. And we can go just to ourselves here. We'll say edit user privileges. And we're gonna go down to the bottom and I kind of alluded to this in the user rights video from before. Um, there's this section at the bottom for uh, e-signatures. And so we'll want to enable record locking customization and also locking unlocking with e-signature authority. And it's just giving us uh, some additional context here of what we'll need to change. So we can save those changes. And I think we're going to need to hit the refresh button so that the options show up. Yep, here they are now. So we can click record locking customization. And this is where we actually specify where we want to enable e-signatures. So in this case, well, I don't know, let's enable them on the Wittar. Um and then we have an option here to put some custom text. So if we don't put anything here, we're just going to have this default text here that says lock record for this form. If not locked, no, uh, if locked, no user will be able to edit this record um, until somebody with lock unlock privileges unlocks it. So if we don't like that, we can enter our own thing here. So we can say maybe please e sign this form. We'll say save. And so if we go and take a look at some of our Wittar data. Let me go to the bottom. You'll see now that we have these two additional options under the form status. So we can lock and we can e-sign. And so let's try both of these. And when we click both of those buttons and we say save and exit or just save it all. Oh, and I still have this enabled. So I'll just say e-sign in. Uh, right, so this is what happens with the e-signature module. So whoever is clicking e-sign is prompted to re-enter their username and password. So in this case, workshop underscore 11, and then the password is, just give me a second. And you'll see now that once that happens, we see this little lock here and this little e-signature shield. And if we go back into the form, um, you'll see now that all of the uh, fields are locked and we're not able to make any changes um, unless we were to go down and actually unlock this form. And I'll note that uh, only people with the lock unlock privileges can unlock it. So for example, this would be like the PI. Typically the, the data entry people would not have unlock privileges. And so just to reiterate, um, in my mind, the way e-signatures should be used is if you need like some kind of study personnel to sign off on a form. Uh, conversely, you would use the signature field in the case where you want to collect the signature of, let's say, you know, a survey respondent or some other person who's entering the data. So anyways, I think that does it for this section. Uh, in the next section, we're going to get further into the uh, additional customization of the field comment log and the data resolution workflow. So with that, I guess I will see you next time.